In a way, I represent here this afternoon the domestic commercial manufacturers, including Syracuse China of New York, Homer Lachlan China of West Virginia, Buffalo China of New York, Sterling China, Ohio, Shenango in Pennsylvania, Hall China, East Liverpool, Lennox China in New Jersey and North Carolina, and False Graph Company in Pennsylvania. As early as 1957, the American Society for Testing Materials considered the problem of lead and cadmium release from glazed ceramic surfaces and initiated efforts to study the reagents, the specimens, and the procedures. This resulted in the publishing of a standard in 1957 for lead release, and this used the uh, dithiazone endpoint method. And that was all that was available. A few years later, simplified procedures were developed, and at the same time, the FDA was developing procedures as the ASTM. And ASTM C7038, which became a test method for lead and cadmium extracted from glazed ceramic surfaces, is essentially the test that is in use today. The refinements of the test continued, and when we started using the atomic absorption spectrometer, we were able to get greater reproducibility and ease in testing. As has been stated this morning, the current test solution uh, consists of exposing the sample for 24 hours at room temperature to a 4% acetic acid uh, solution. Then the cadmium and lead extracted are measured by ato atomic absorption spectrometry. While the original limits were seven parts per million for lead and a half a part per million for cadmium, those have been changed, as been mentioned this morning. The U.S. Potters Association, which I represent, is the clearinghouse for information on heavy metal release and is a channel through which information is exchanged on the quality assurance programs of the domestic ceramic foodware manufacturers. We have certified a variety of laboratories around the country, any that ask, to be able to perform lead and cadmium release. Every six months, or whenever a procedure is changed, or a new glaze, or a new decoration is used, the domestic manufacturer sends at least six pieces to one of these laboratories for analysis. The laboratory sends back the results to the manufacturer, who forwards a copy to the U.S. Potters Association, and on a periodic basis, we forward this information to the Food and Drug Administration. In response to your committee, a few weeks ago, I submitted from the uh, using companies for the last five years the records on which we had for the lead release. As I examined those before I forwarded them to you, I found that in no case were there results of over two parts per million of lead release in any samples that were submitted by the domestic manufacturers. And this, of course, is uh, in below the level of for any of the ISO, the ASTM, or the Food and Drug Administration levels. With a single exception of a 1960 incident of lead poisoning involving a wear from a now defunct company, there hasn't been any case of ceramic foodware produced by a commercial domestic manufacturer which has known to contribute excessive amounts of food uh, level to foodstuff. Now the incidents of high lead release from ceramic foodware from Italy, Mexico, and the People's Republic of China have been highly, highly reported as they should be. We've had the, uh, many press articles, but very seldom do they adequately explain that this is preponderantly domestic or imported ware. The commercial domestic ceramic foodware manufacturers have adopted a program of self-monitoring to assure that their products meet FDA and world standards. This surveillance program must be expanded to include art potteries, small one and two person shops, and any other domestic manufacturer of ceramic ware conceivably used for containing food and drink. There must be increased emphasis on FDA surveillance on all imported ware to ensure compliance. Importers must be required to furnish a certificate with each lot attesting that these standards have been complied with and showing the level of heavy metal release. There must be FDA certified international laboratories to perform these tests. Imported ware failing to meet FDA standards should be immediately impounded return to the originating country, or summarily destroy. As we've heard this morning, there have been proposals to reduce the ISO and FDA lead release values in hollow air of 1.1 liters to, or more to a one point, uh, to one tenth of a part per million of lead release. Now, coincidentally, this is the limit of detectability by the atomic absorption spectrometer of lead in, in ceramics. Now, for the most part, Ceramic wear seems to be in one, two categories. It's either a very low lead level or it's far outside the limits. As we talked this morning, uh, Don Wallace reporting hundreds of parts per million. But we didn't hear any examples of cases of two or three of 10 or 15 parts per million. It is either fired properly or it's, in, or it's improper. We feel that to tighten FDA standards without increased surveillance on imported wear will not achieve the desired results. 
Those importers who, for whatever reason, import unsafe wear from non-complying countries will continue to do that unless these standards are tightened. And those domestic commercial manufacturers who voluntarily formulate safe wear and who document their efforts will continue to provide safe ceramic food wear. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Beals. Mr. Connolly. Thank you. William Sonoma has offered imported ceramic wear to the public since 1956 when the company was founded. Although the company is, is 32 years old, it was only doing about $4 million back in 1979 and rose to about $35 million in 1983-84. Currently, the company with its four divisions, uh, two of which do not sell any pottery uh, at all, uh, to speak of, contribute about $136 million in volume. Because of its uh, beauty and utility, ceramic wear has played a small but important part in our merchandise selection. Of the total sales, it accounts for about 10% of our sales overall. Uh, it would be much less of the total company sales. And uh, between that, about half is uh, porcelain wear and the other would be uh, earthenware. We are very fortunate in that our company enjoys an excellent reputation. In every independent survey of customer satisfaction, our company has been ranked at or near the top. But we believe that this reputation carries with it the burden of maintaining it, and that means reacting responsibly when customers' health may be at risk. And it's this importance that we place in our reputation that led us to take a number of actions that we did in 86 and since. In the March of 86, the FDA in Memphis requested uh, samples of a large round partially glazed uh, Spanish pie, uh, cazuela pan that ex attested above the acceptable levels and uh, six weeks after another uh, piece of ceramic ore was found also to have above acceptable levels. Uh, in both cases we destroyed, we took offhand and destroyed voluntarily the pieces that were in our inventory and decided on our own to recall all of the pieces at large. In the case of the cazuela we went back and recalled all of the previous year's uh, items that were sold even though there was no indication that they were unsafe. Uh, the FDA designated this as a class two recall. By uh, letters went out to all of our customers and a voucher was given in, in exchange for return of the merchandise or them responding to us that it had been destroyed. By the August of 86, approximately 73% of the Cazuela and 66% of the Valencia Jug customers had responded to us, which was a substantial success according to the FDA. Prior to the uh, recall in April of 86, uh, William Sonoma relied heavily on our buyers and close working relationships with ceramic manufacturers. Actually, prior to the mid 80s, we had not imported directly much uh, ceramic ware from high-risk countries such as Spain, Portugal, or parts of Italy. Mr. Williams, who was the founder of the company, approved and actually selected almost every piece of ceramic ware that we sold throughout its 32-year history. When we discovered the uh, problem with the Cazuela, we sampled all of the existing ceramic ware in our warehouse. And our quality assurance manager in Memphis made arrangements with a reliable lab for regular testing on selected items. On a periodic basis, independently of whatever the FDA might require, we sample new shipments of items judged to hold possible risk of leachable lead. Since uh, May of 86, we have tested voluntarily 75 different samples in addition to 115 shipments that the FDA tested during these years. Most of these were under the auto. These were under the auto detention program. We detected uh, lead in two types of Italian ceramic ware and, and sold neither. The FDA uh, detected a marginal lead failure in a Chinese bowl where some spatterings of paint had been on the inside of the, of the bowl, and th those were destroyed. We believe that uh, for the future, we would like to see more uh, compliance at the source. In that regard, uh, we have, uh, in addition to our ongoing testing program, placed a full-time person in Europe who, as one of their primary responsibilities, visits the factories, informs them of our uh, standards, 
and is in the process of setting up uh, reliable laboratories that we can obtain uh, accurate results from. Uh, in the Far East, uh, similar efforts are underway. And that's, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Connolly. Mr. Johnson. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> My name is Clark A. Johnson, and I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of Kirwan Imports Incorporated. My brief statement this afternoon is a summary of the written statement transmitted to this subcommittee on June 22, 1988. I will begin by providing a brief history of Pier 1 Imports and its operation. During the past 25 years, Pier 1 Imports has become North America's leading specialty retailer of decorative and functional home furnishing items. Currently, its 4,700 different products are imported from more than 60 countries around the world for sale through 404 <coughs> retail stores with a company goal of 500 stores to be open during the next decade. During the past four years, total company sales have grown from 147 million to 327 million. Pier 1 has founded its business on the sale of quality products not generally available to consumers in the United States from North American companies. Since supplier relationships are crucial to Pier 1 Imports success in the North American market, the company has placed special emphasis on communicating the company's long-term requirements to these inventory sources. The experience, judgment, and professionalism of our buying staff is based upon knowledge gained in foreign markets beginning with the opening of the first company store in the San Francisco Bay Area in 1962. Purchases of ceramic items fell within this stable and informed group of buyers. It is a matter of record that the first recall of any ceramic ware item by Pier 1 uh, did not occur until 1986, uh, 23 years after uh, we'd uh, begun our operations. During the year 1986 and 1987, however, Pier 1 ceramic recalls reached a level that was totally unacceptable to the company. An internal review culminated in a search to determine whether testing of all ceramic items with each purchase order before implementation was feasible. A worldwide uh, testing agency was located and retained for this program, and it's now in effect today, uh, per what, uh, what Dr. Beals uh, said uh, was his recommendation. The subcommittee has also expressed interest in the percentage of Pier 1 import sales attributable to ceramic ware. Estimates in some instances were required because of the many different items we handle to determine percentages with broader inventory categories. For the year, fiscal year 1988, it is the company's estimate that out of sales of 313 million, there was an estimated 12 million dollars related to a variety of ceramic sales. Uh, that percentage for the fiscal year equals 3.9 percent. I would say decorative ceramics, such as uh, is the crux of what we're talking about today, uh, would be under 1 percent of our total sales. Uh, the projection of sales for fiscal 1989 is 392 million with an estimate of 15 million in ceramic related sales. That percentage will drop from 3.9 to 3.7. The companies which supply ceramic items to Pier 1 include Japan, France, the Philippines, China, Thailand, Hungary, Italy, East Germany, West Germany, Portugal, Peru, Brazil, Mexico, Spain, England, and of course the United States. We also attempted to determine the company's total number of FDA annual inspections of ceramic ware between 1970 and 1987 uh, per the request of the committee. Within our records, no count of FDA inspections of ceramic ware existed in our records prior to August 1987. That doesn't say they didn't exist, but we didn't have records of that. It is our understanding that all shipments, uh, shipments importing ceramic ware are initially detained pursuant to an FDA importer's entry notice. Between August and December 1987, our records indicate 18 notices of detention and hearings were issued. 17 were subsequently released and one resulted in a recall for labeling of a decorative item. Between January and May of 1988 this year, our records show FDA releases on approximately 19 ceramic items with no failures. 
Prior to 1986, Pier 1 relied almost exclusively on its buyer's extensive experience with suppliers and agents to assure the quality of ceramic items. It was the practice to import from low-risk countries and suppliers like Japan, which have manufacturing standards comparable to FDA guidelines. Following the recent recall experience on Italian and Spanish products, it became obvious that Formal testing to validate quality assurance as a backup to buyer's experience should take place in the country of origin rather than in the United States after the product has entered the distribution system. In 1987, the company initiated a program to require test confirmation of leaching levels in the country of manufacture. Now, every purchase order requires confirmation of compliance with FDA requirements before shipping. And the way that works, Mr. Chairman, is we get that information before the product is authorized to be shipped from the country of origin. In addition, we also selected 58 ceramic items from our United States inventory and tested them recently in a U.S. laboratory. To date, these tests have cost the company more than $70,000 and none of the items have failed. Throughout Pier 1's history, the Food and Drug Administration and the World Health Organization have been primary agencies participating in efforts to attempt to determine dangerous levels of lead contamination. Looking upon the regulatory levels and focusing on actual experience in the marketplace, Pier 1 cannot cite to this sub subcommittee to any confirmed report that any of of its ceramics actually harmed a consumer. This is after the sale of literally hundreds of thousands of ceramic pieces over a quarter of a century from suppliers that span the globe. Based on that experience, the company at this time sees no merit in offering alternative standards. We do feel a review uh, may be in order of FDA compliance guidelines which require that ceramic items imported for decorative use must be specifically labeled or rendered unusable if lead or cadmium leaching beyond the standard could occur. And I think we were, we were very supportive of the idea of drilling a hole in some of these products uh, to, uh, to solve that, uh, that problem for food usage. Pier 1 feels that requiring the label to be affixed to the potential food contact surface would be inappropriate with these products. Such labelings deface the item and destroy its decorative usefulness for the consumer. Labeling on any surface visible to a user on inspection, we would think would be sufficient. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as part of my formal remarks, I would also like to just clarify one thing that I heard in the earlier testimony this morning and that was in relationship to the goods that were shipped to Canada that did not meet the Canadian requirements. We brought those goods back to the United States and we worked with the FDA and uh, we worked with their guidelines on what we could do in this country uh, to make those goods saleable. Uh, after the recall took place, we destroyed those goods and those goods were never introduced into the American market. But I do want the record to reflect that, uh, like we've tried to do all during this difficult time, is play by the rules as we understood them to the best of our ability. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Johnson, thank you. And that's our understanding uh, with respect to the Canadian matter as well, and I appreciate your stating it. Let me just make sure, though, that I understand the position of the company with regard to the future and the rules and, and the enforcement thereof. In your uh, testimony, you uh, address the adequacy of the current rules, the current FDA lead release guidelines by stating, and I quote, no reliable information has come to the attention of Pier 1 imports which indicates that the standards or their enforcement are inadequate to protect the public safety. Now we have had a great deal of testimony this morning including uh, Commissioner Young's saying that the rules definitely need to be beefed up. The rules need to be beefed up and enforcement needs to be strengthened and strengthened considerably, particularly because of the effect on young people. I mean, that's what we're really concerned about is the, the kids of this, this country. And Dr. Young goes on to state, and I quote here, they cannot afford much higher lead intakes than they are already getting. Now, in view of this kind of testimony, and I think you were here for at least a part of it yes, uh, was. this morning, is it still your contention that the current FDA guidelines for lead release are adequate 
to protect the public safety? I, I would say this, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the succinct position of our company is this. Uh, we want to work uh, with the FDA and with the committee to establish rules that in, 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 in the prudent judgment of those involved that makes uh, people safe in buying these products. If we are not able to do that, the ultimate solution we would have would be to discontinue the sale of those products. So, uh, so we stand four square behind uh, putting rules in effect that uh, assure that customers that come to a Pier 1 store not only don't buy ceramic products that would have any adverse effect on their health, but don't buy any products uh, that would, would adversely affect their health and well-being. So, Well, but, but still with respect to, to my question, um, in your prepared remarks you essentially state that the current FDA lead release guidelines are adequate and we have had considerable testimony over the last three or four hours that that is simply not the case. And I guess what I would like to know now is do you agree with Commissioner Young who has said that the rules are inadequate or do you agree with your prepared testimony which says that the rules are adequate? Well I would say Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker that we have done the best to, to operate within the laws as they are now. If it is uh, a body of knowledge of people far more learned than I am uh, that these are outside of the limits for good health and uh, that legislation or, uh, or judicial activity should be such to change those, then we would abide with those with the greatest alacrity and uh, it would be impossible for me to uh, appear before you today and say that I wasn't for good health because I am. So a direct answer to your question, if those rules need to be changed, then I think we would enthusiastically support the change of those rules. And, uh, and my testimony was put together before I had the benefit of hearing uh, uh, Dr. Young's remarks. And truthfully, I arrived late at the hearings and I didn't hear all of his remarks. So, Well, I, I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Young did call for some dramatic changes in both uh, the nature of the lead uh, action levels and in terms of the uh, enforcement and we uh, wish very much to have your company and other companies strongly support him in those efforts and you have said today that uh, you would. You can count on that support. That, that is uh, what the subcommittee is interested in and I appreciate it. Dr. Beals, in your testimony you state that it would be unwise and unnecessary to lower the lead release guideline for large hollowware from 2.5 parts per million to 0 0.1 parts per million because most ceramic wear, quote, will either conform very well or will be far outside the out current limits. Are you telling us that most domestically produced ceramic wear is likely to be significantly above 7.0 parts per million or below 0.1 parts per million? I can't tell you below 0 .01, 0 0.1 parts per million because that's the limit of detectability. However, looking at the records for the last five years, which I submitted to you, and looking back farther than that, I saw no incident of more than two parts per million and only one of those in any lead release from the domestic manufacturers who voluntarily submitted their statements. There were none in the, even in the above two and a half. I'm, I'm well, sorry, was that the... Let, let me, let me uh, pursue this because we have evidence uh, okay. that you gave us that con contradicts that statement. Now, you provided the subcommittee with the ceramic wear test results of USPA members over a five-year period. While most results showed levels less than 2.0 parts per million, a significant number of test results that you supplied us from one manufacturer were in the 1.1 to 3.6 parts per million uh, range. And contrary to the testimony that you've given us, some of the lead levels were uh, even higher. Now similarly, test results provided by Pier 1 for a shipment of imported pitchers showed an average lead release of 1.6 parts per million. Now it's clear that there are a significant number of items falling within the 0.1 to 2.5 parts per million range. But we have received strong testimony here today about the need to reduce controllable sources of lead exposure for kids. Now, do you still contend that a reduction in the FDA action level to 0.1 parts per million is unnecessary? 
or are you really saying that this level is just too expensive to meet? I'm saying that point one is, is the limit of detectability by the, uh, a, a technique which has financial ability. The atomic absorption spectrometer will measure lead release levels to one-tenth of a part per million. Below that, it's merely reported as being less than one-tenth of a part per million. To say that you wanted a hundredth part per million of lead would involve tests that I am not familiar exist. I presume they do, but I don't know about them. Well, we're, we're talking about limited detection. We're talking about point one. Yes, that's the limit of detectability. I still don't understand what's the problem with that. I'm saying you can't go below that unless you come up with a different test. Because that is the limit of detectability. You can't, you can't tell if you have anything below a 10. No, no one is proposing going below that. Certainly the FDA is not proposing going Originally below. the FDA, when I talked to them, were talking about zero. I had FDA in the plant oh. last year, in June of last year, and one of the scientists at that time was talking about zero, parts, uh, zero lead release. And I pointed out it was impossible mm -hmm. by present detection. He said there are machines that will test parts per billion. Well, do you and does your organization then support 0.1 parts per million? Certainly. Pardon me? Certainly. Certainly. Uh, Mr. Connolly and Mr. Uh, Leopold, could you comment uh, on the adequacy of the current FDA lead release uh, guidelines uh, as well? Begin with you, Mr. Connolly. Based on what we've heard here today, I would have to go along with Dr. Young and what's been said earlier and we'll comply with whatever uh, the rules become. I would agree with that also. Okay. Mr. Leopold, in uh, your testimony, you state that Highmark Enterprises requires foreign suppliers to certify that their goods meet FDA's lead release guidelines, and to ensure this, Highmark periodically tests some of its products with independent laboratories. Now. Is it correct that Highmark has only tested one shipment for lead release under this so-called periodic testing program? Recently we have, yes. Now, we also ask that our I'm sorry. We also ask that our suppliers overseas perform these tests as well. In order to issue that statement, they would have to do that. Now, since your quality assurance program relies you know, very heavily on this foreign supplier to test the items prior to shipment, do you customarily ask for copies of the test results? No, we do not. What do you do? Do you require some other process, certification, or something of that? No, we just have them issue the statement saying that the uh, shipment that's involved will pass FDA inspection. FDA, likewise, inspects it at the pier prior to release. Um, now, in a telephone conversation with your uh, staff, uh, Mr. Leopold, uh, it was stated that Highmark's procedures were very typical of the imp import industry. And it was noted that it was a standard practice in the industry to make letters of credit contingent on a certification that FDA's guidelines are met, but that importers typically don't require that testing results be provided. Is that uh, correct? I cannot talk for any other importers. I can only talk for our company. Well, let's call uh, Mr. Asta up then, if he uh, is with us in the audience. No, um, he wasn't able to come today. He was ill. Okay. Well, for, for the record, that, uh, that was what uh, Mr. Asta did state, that it was standard uh, practice in the industry to make letters of credit contingent on a certification that FDA's lead guidelines are met. But he also went on to state that importers typically don't require the testing results uh, be provided. Um, the only other question I, I had, uh, Mr. Leopold, was uh, we were told by uh, Mr. Asta that uh, Highmark's ceramic ware was at the low priced end of the spectrum and that, quote, testing every shipment would be too expensive. Do you generally agree with the statement that well, the Mr. price Asta range of our merchandise is toward the lower end as compared to very high-priced uh, ceramic articles that certain other importers bring in, yes. Okay. Uh, food and drug does, like I, I keep reiterating, uh, set itself up as a policing body. 
and they do inspect the shipments prior to them coming in and being released. If Food and Drug sets themselves up as a policing body, I can only assume that they're doing their job. Well, that was, that was why we were so concerned about what uh, seemed to be so many gaps in, uh, in their program this morning and why we, we very much want a beefed up, uh, beefed up program because I'm not convinced that that assumption that you're talking about is one that uh, has been warranted. Mr. Johnson, um, in your testimony you described the quality assurance procedures now in place at Pier 1. Now, Mr. Long, is it correct that up until late 1987, Pier 1 had no testing program in place to assure that ceramic ware imports complied with FDA's lead guidelines and that Pier 1 relied exclusively on the experience of its buyers to purchase safe ceramic ware? Yeah. That's correct. And I think it's uh, something that's being shared by all of the other speakers today. Uh, the exception with Pier 1, and I'd like to uh, have it on record, uh, uh, Ms. Downs and Ms. Jacobson would uh, verify that uh, Pier 1 traditionally has a very, very small buying staff by industry standards. Um, but certainly the first 10 years of our 25 years, there was one person responsible for ceramic uh, purchasing. Uh, that is the same today. The, uh, the responsibility for purchasing ceramics um, uh, has been in the hands of a single person for a number of years. and. Uh, we believe that uh, just as Mr. and Ms. Wallace have a, a gut feeling for uh, what they think uh, is possibly a, a, a problem item, uh, we have to rely heavily on many years of international travel and experience um, reiterated by the, the business that Pier 1 Imports is in. So I, I feel that uh, um, without any other testing facilities available, that was um, um, a, a, a pretty good measure. Uh, particularly, and it hasn't been stated, and I'd, I'd like to make that statement fairly clear because I think it is important for record. Uh, we are now in uh, a fashion business with ceramics. If you look at the items on the table, um, color, shape, texture, uh, important ingredients of meeting the demands of our customer today. And uh, it is, I think, a true statement to say that this business of decorative ceramics as well as tabletop is much more colorful and much more visual than it has been for many, many years. And uh, one of the reasons that I think uh, we have had a pretty good record over the years is that uh, in the early days we were very heavily into white porcelain and, uh, and simple uh, non-colored ceramic ware, which has now changed, I think, from uh, certainly the mid-80s. Let me refer you to an uh, article that was in the Washington Post Weekly Edition in uh, January uh, of 87, January 12th, 1987. The article includes comments from Jim Pruka, a major buyer for Pier 1. At the time the article was prepared, Mr. Pruka stated that Pier 1 did not normally test its imports for lead releases, but counted on suppliers to fire their products properly. Mr. Pruka further emphasized that testing every shipment would not be, in his words, cost effective. Mr. Long, uh, my question to you is why did Pier 1 reverse this position in late 1987 and decide to initiate a testing program to prevent excessive lead release from its imported ceramic ware? I think the answer to that question is, is uh, twofold. Um, I have to answer it from my position as uh, a merchandise director. Um, I have two roles. One is to keep our customer coming back and two to keep our stockholders happy. And uh, with that responsibility, we um, are a place to discover. It is my job to direct buyers to travel uh, to as many countries in the world to make that shopping experience worthwhile. Uh, traditionally, um, as has been the record, ceramics for many, many years have been bought from few countries. Uh, as you saw from our testimony, we are actively buying ceramics from 20 countries around the world. And it was a fair statement to say that certainly in places like uh, East Germany and Leipzig, which is a, a very big ceramic producing country, um, they've never even heard of FDA, let alone understand what the requirements to meet FDA standards are. So I think at the time Mr. Brucker made that comment, um, it, uh, it was a comment that uh, had some validity. Now, 
Mr. Long, you sent a letter to your uh, foreign buying agents in the fall and winter of 1987. The letter followed Pier 1's fourth ceramic uh, ware recall in a two-year uh, period, and the letter informed the company's foreign buying agents of your new corporate policy regarding the testing of ceramic ware samples. In your opening uh, paragraph uh, to the letter, you state uh, uh, the reasons for the new policy, and I quote here, the time spent this year in dealing with the violations, the cost of recalling and destroying merchandise, as well as the adverse publicity, has been considerable. In short, the time has come to change our procedures so that we may comply fully with the required uh, regulation. My question, Mr. Long, is isn't it correct that the major reason that Pier 1 instituted these uh, stricter procedures to detect excessive lead release was that the costs of non-compliance finally became too high in the company's view? Um, I don't share that opinion. No. Pardon me? I don't share that opinion. No. Well, what, uh, what was the principal reason that uh, the company... The principal reason, as Mr. Johnson has said, is that we're a growing company. We um, are the biggest chain of specialty import retailers in America and growing more rapidly than any other specialty retailer and as part of good business management and sound judgment from a merchandising point of view uh, meeting the demands of our customer their safety their satisfaction are our primary goals and certainly my primary goal and therefore I think we'd reached a, um, a point in our life where we had to instigate ourselves some measures of making sure that we would not play hit and miss game of being caught or may not being caught um, and that was the primary motivation of the decision which was made uh, from my level um, within the company. Mr. Long, set aside the, the case and, and this letter which um, seems to me to be focusing mostly on, on costs, at least uh, the portion that, uh, that, uh, that I've, I've seen, and, and discuss the motivations of typical importers selling in a highly uh, competitive uh, environment. Do you think that many importers, particularly smaller uh, operations, are unlikely to institute aggressive testing procedures to monitor for excessive lead release unless they feel that the likelihood of detection by FDA and the penalties for noncompliance are significant? Mr. Speaker, you're asking me to make a comment on companies that I have no control over. I would prefer not to make a, an observation on that. If you want well, me to make an opinion, I will. but. Uh, you're asking that, me a question I can't answer. Yeah, I mean, what we, what we want to know is what are the motivations of importers that are likely to uh, produce compliance? As I say, I can only answer the question from Pier 1's point of view. If you'd like to redirect it from that perspective, I'll be happy to give you an answer. Mr. Connolly, what, uh, what would be your uh, answer to, uh, to that question? Would you agree that Many uh, importers are unlikely to institute aggressive testing uh, procedures in this area unless they feel that the likelihood of detection by FDA and the penalties for noncompliance are significant? I think that the companies that have the high visibility are uh, certainly the ones that uh, are going to make uh, every possible effort. And beyond that, with the smaller ones, it would be some would, you know, very much so. And it, it it depends upon their level of concern and their uh, their knowledge of the problem. It it would there would be more variance probably than there would have among larger companies. So I can't really say other than that. Mr. Connolly, uh, FDA officials testified to the subcommittee uh, about the uh, agreement, the memorandum of understanding with the People's Republic of China. This document requires the testing of samples from each production lot destined for the U.S. This means that if there's a change in the type of glaze used, for example, the new lead test must be conducted. The importance of testing subsequent shipments was highlighted at the subcommittee in a recent letter from the Vice President of Action Industries, Linda Wyckoff. In this letter, Ms. Wyckoff states, and I quote, an effective quality assurance program must include procedures for periodic testing, not only of the initial samples on an item, but also of subsequent shipments of the item. Suppliers sometimes change their product formulations or their production methods, or they may substitute seemingly comparable merchandise, resulting in shipments that do not meet require, required standards. The importer can't know of these changes without contractual sampling of the merchandise being received. 
My question is, did William Sonoma have a requirement to test subsequent production lots of high-risk ceramics in effect at the time of the 86 recalls of the Spanish pitchers and casserole dishes? We put that program into effect, sir, and tested all subsequent uh, receipts. That was after that um, recall? Yes. Okay. We had tested on the Cazuela twice prior to, uh, it had been tested twice prior to the uh, recall uh, uh, batch. It was tested in, it, we tested it before we sold it in 1983. It was tested and found safe again in 1984. Uh, when it was tested in 86 and found to be unsafe, we recalled everything back to hmm. the previous test. But that particular batch had not been tested? No, it had not. Prior. Okay. Mr. Connolly and uh, Ms. Utz, does your testimony indicate that William Sonoma still has not fully implemented procedures requiring the testing of each production lot of high risk uh, ceramic ware? I think that's, that's a fair statement. I don't think we're entirely satisfied with where we are yet. Now, Ms. Utz, is it correct that you stated in a phone interview with the subcommittee staff in April that the company's procedures during the past year involved the selection of six to ten high-risk items in each catalog for testing prior to distribution? Yes. Now, please uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, but in the case of your company's uh, recall of Spanish casserole dishes, I understand the initial product tests were acceptable. However, the later shipments, which were violative of FDA's guidelines, were never tested by Williams-Sonoma. In view of the lesson learned from this incident, can Williams-Sonoma really assure compliance with FDA's lead release guidelines if it doesn't retest subsequent shipments after the initial order? Well, yes, but we did retest the Caswell at once. I think you've got your finger on the crux of the problem. How many shipments do you test? Do you test every shipment? Do you temper that decision based on what you know about the producer if he has good results for a, a series of tests? Do you possibly then shift your attention to something else? Um, it's, it's an issue we have to grapple with, especially if testing is expensive. And I think that's why we would rather try to shift the testing to Europe, say, uh, and test probably as many shipments, pre-shipments uh, pre as we can, so that we don't have to worry about that at, in Memphis. So when you talk about tightening your procedures, that latter point is what you're really talking about, is shifting as much That's testing right. to Europe and the source. Any other steps that you're planning to take with respect to tightening procedures? Well, in the Far East, we do like the idea of this memorandum of understanding and we, as far as our discussions with our agent, it appears that there is some room for um, inspection and greater involvement of this, uh, of, of internal Chinese agencies in going to the factory and finding out what their standards are. Um, we'd be in favor of anything that gave us some confidence about what factories are good and what aren't and we'll avoid the bad ones. Mr. Johnson, it's my understanding under your company's new procedures, you follow the approach of testing every shipment now, even in cases where prior deliveries of the same item had been tested. Is that correct? Yes, that's my understanding. Now, isn't it correct that Pier 1's imports new testing policy isn't limited to so-called high-risk uh, countries, but now covers imports from all the countries? Yes, that's correct and the company has taken this stringent uh, approach just so we have it for the record for what reason? We've taken this problem as very serious and it's, it's serious in, in, a, in a whole wide range of areas. Uh, but, uh, but quite clearly we don't uh, want to put ourselves in the position where we're selling a product, a good or a service that, that could have uh, any possibility of being harmful to one of our customers. And I think we're putting belts and suspenders on to, to cope with a problem. And I think, as everybody has said here, it's a difficult problem. Uh, uh, Multi-countries, uh, thousands of suppliers, some suppliers buying products from other suppliers. Uh, but there's no other way to do it than, than I think the way we've come up with. And we're very serious in our intentions to follow through on a continuing basis. Yeah. Mr. Connolly, uh, how can you be sure that your company's <coughs> program 
a program that limits testing to the so-called high-risk uh, ceramic ware isn't going to allow a significant number of hazardous uh, shipments to uh, fall through the cracks. We have, the, in the area of what we call high-risk, we look at some things that are very much at the limits of that. Uh, in terms of our traditional uh, whiteware suppliers where we've been buying for uh, 30 years, the, the possibility of that, of lead being included in those kinds of items is, is very small. And uh, we do test those on a random basis occasionally. Okay. We, have our, excuse, we also have our own, we have placed our own person in Europe who has visited all of our factories and uh, worked with them in terms of this problem. Dr. Beals, at the outset, uh, I think it's important to clarify the segment of the domestic industry which uh, you've focused on. It's my understanding that your testimony is focused on the practices of the 10 member companies of the U.S. Potters Association, uh, which are listed in the exhibits. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. Dr. Beals, your testimony reveals that the U.S. Potters Association, founded back in 1875, began a surveillance program in 1970 to monitor lead release from ceramic ware. Prior to 1970, did Hall, China, or any other member of the U.S. Potters Association conduct a comprehensive program to monitor lead release from ceramic ware? I'm not aware of it. Now, did you find suspect pre-1960 ware? Sir? Did you find suspect pre-1960 uh, ceramic ware. There, my understanding you told the staff that you did? I told the staff that there were ware, yes, uh, some of which might be on that table, some of the ware that was produced prior to 1960 that contained uranium oxide, uh, some of the orange colors, and yes, some of those were suspect. Okay. Let me turn now to the current quality control procedures of your association. In interviews with the subcommittee staff, both you and FDA's uh, Ed Steele have stated that a key element of quality assurance program for ceramic, uh, ceramic ware safety is to carefully monitor both fuel and temperature to assure proper firing. Could you uh, briefly explain how the domestic industry manages uh, what is clearly a critical uh, quality control procedure? Most of the domestic industry, and of course I can't speak for all, but essentially all the domestic industry keeps very accurate kill records. These, these are for the most part tunnel, a continuous kill, and so that they maintain written charts and also most of them take an hourly reading on temperatures, on air controls, different things of that particular type. Uh, they of course are interested in turning out a good product, so they do keep these uh, very careful controls. They know they keep a surplus of oxygen, they keep temperatures in the range that will ensure that the lead which is in the glaze is contained in an insoluble form. So I would, I would assume that the larger companies would use things like computerized monitoring and that sort of thing. What, uh, what's your understanding of the quality control procedures for the small mom and pop domestic pottery uh, operations and the steps they take to prevent lead, uh, excessive lead release? I would suspect that they range from very good to almost non-existent. Do they typically follow quality control procedures similar to those of the U.S. Potters Association? I have no knowledge that they do or do not. Uh, except those that I've had contact with and we have monitored, I have no way to know. Now, didn't you state to the subcommittee staff on May 25th that anybody can set up a kiln in their backyard and they can produce extremely poisonous wear if not controlled properly? That's correct. This is why I advocated in my, written, my prepared statement today that one and two man shops be regulated as the commercial dinnerware people regulate themselves. Now in your testimony you gave a uh, extensive description of domestic quality assurance programs which have significantly improved the safety of domestic ceramic ware. Other countries such as the United Kingdom and West Germany have not been the subject of any U.S. recalls during the past five years and, the, and have experienced extremely low violation rates. My question, Dr. Beals, would be, do you believe that industry and government testing programs in such countries are stronger than those present in the countries experiencing consistently high violation rates? I would assume they are, yes. Okay. Um, a question or two 
uh, about the decorative exemption, which uh, we have talked uh, some about, uh, based on everything that uh, we've heard over the last uh, few hours about the adverse uh, health effects of lead released from ceramics, uh, from ceramic ware. FDA has acknowledged an ability to inspect individual shipments in retail stores and the difficulties Pier 1 has uh, had a, uh, with the relabeling of its uh, ceramic uh, ware. Uh, we question the wisdom of a decorative exemption that allows uh, excessive lead release. There's a slip up in the labeling or the warning labels peel off. Many Americans risk lead poisoning from the use of seemingly innocent bowls and pitchers. And I think what I'd like to do for a minute is hear how uh, those of you on this uh, industry panel have fashioned your corporate policies regarding lead release for uh, decorative items which aren't intended uh, for food use. Now let me begin, if I, I could, with you, Mr. Connolly. You indicate that Williams-Sonoma is currently seeking to implement a program of lead testing and documentation. Under your current program, must all ceramic ware sold by Williams-Sonoma meet FDA lead release guidelines, or do you plan to sell decorative items which exceed those levels? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, we make sure that everything is, uh, passes the FDA guidelines. We don't sell things that are just as decorative. Now, Mr. Long, it's unclear to me whether it's Pier 1's new policy to make all ceramic ware meet FDA's lead release guidelines or whether, as outlined in your letters to foreign buying agents, decorative bowls, plates, and wine jugs can release excessive amounts of lead so long as they're labeled to meet FDA's decorative exemption. What will be the FDA policy uh, in this regard? Excuse me, what would be the Pier 1 policy in this regard? Thank you. You're asking me to comment for somebody else again. Um, our policy is that we um, would like uh, fairly quickly to get together with our friends from FDA to look at sensible legislation requirement uh, to enable us to continue to import uh, traditional ethnic decorative ceramics purely because that is the function of our business and there are many, many customers out there that appreciate art forms spanning centuries uh, from countries that we, we visit. Um, we took issue with uh, sticking a label predominantly on the middle of the uh, food surface um, because we felt, as we said in our testimony, that this just defaced the item and uh, rendered it uh, uh, useless as a decorative item. Um, we're open for looking at it. Our, our policy at this moment in time is to put a halt on any decorative uh, 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 ceramic items that exceed the, uh, uh, the FDA requirements. And uh, we're looking forward to, to, with interest to uh, work on a way of uh, successfully um, achieving our goal, which ideally would be able to continue to bring these items in uh, because we feel that uh, uh, those traditions are the same traditions and spirit of our business, um, as again demonstrated by the items on the table. Let me just make sure I've got the, the company policy. And I think you heard me say in February of 81, we were concerned when Pier 1's last uh, recall was declared in, ineffective after the FDA inspectors found 11 Pier 1 stores selling unlabeled or mislabeled articles. What you're saying now, post that February 1981 uh, uh, situation is that you will uh, discontinue importing uh, decorative items under the decorative uh, exemption that doesn't meet the FDA requirements. That's correct. Okay. In other words, we had outstanding commitments that we went back on and specifically checked. Um, uh, traditionally, these, these items are highly visible and they are really from very few uh, markets. Um, and uh, we were able to catch them in time, test them, and uh, we are assured that we will not bring anything in under the decorative accessory classification that doesn't meet the FDA requirements. Well, I, I think that's an important policy and an important, uh, important shift because I think that if we can out of this hearing send that kind of message that Pier 1's new policy and, and your associates in this in this business are going to make sure that all ceramic ware meet uh, FDA's lead release uh, guidelines that uh, is an important uh, 
important message uh, in and of itself. I'd like to make one other comment, if, uh, if I may. We looked uh, for some considerable time uh, to find uh, a testing facility that is international, that uh, understands the language barrier and certainly understands the requirements of, uh, of FDA, and it wasn't uh, until fairly recently we were able to locate such an international service. And uh, I think it might uh, be a suggestion for FDA to help the smaller retailers in particular uh, with a means of locating an international testing service that would uh, would enable merchandise not to be shipped and uh, not to arrive in the port of entry then to be determined that it's uh, that it's uh, non-compliant. Dr. Beals in a uh, meeting with the subcommittee staff uh, earlier this year you and several of your colleagues indicated that it was inappropriate to allow decorative wear such as pictures to release lead at hundreds of times the acceptable level. Is it still your view that FDA should reconsider its current exemption for non-food use items? I don't think I've changed my viewpoint. Okay. Well, this has uh, been a lengthy and I think very uh, instructive uh, hearing and I would just send two comments back uh, you know, with you. One is that we are going to make sure that FDA tightens up its lead action guidelines in this area and much more aggressively enforces those, those guidelines. And we uh, are going to look to industry to strongly support a beefed up FDA uh, program and we'll look to all of you uh, for your support for those efforts as we pursue them with the Food and uh, Drug Administration. The other point, and I think it, uh, it's a fairly obvious one, that it would be much better to control these, these problems before we get to the recall stage. I mean, that clearly is in the interest of uh, everyone in the American uh, business sector because of the adverse uh, uh, publicity, uh, certainly uh, uh, publicity that has not uh, helped your company, and also for the very obvious health uh, effects that we've been stressing uh, this morning. So I think those... Uh, uh, lay the groundwork for an effective uh, uh, set of policy uh, changes and uh, unless you uh, you uh, all have anything that you'd like to add further we will uh, excuse you uh, this time unless the minority council has any questions that uh, they wish to ask. Uh, majority uh, staff have anything? Do any of our witnesses uh, have anything they'd like to add? If not uh, we will uh, find a gavel here and subcommittees adjourned. <laughs>